Welcome back to the Gentleman's Gazette in our series on steaks. Yes, you heard right. It's a multi-part series where we just talk about steaks, how to buy them, what kind of cuts there are, what to pay attention to, how to prepare it, and anything else you want to know about this wonderful piece of meat. <laughs> In today's video, we go over the steak cuts, what makes them flavorful or tender, what to pay attention to, as well as what to avoid. For many men, steak is their favorite meal. It can be a treat at a restaurant or a point of pride about preparing it to perfection at home. I would consider myself a foodie and steak is definitely one of those hotly contested items where there are many different opinions and there are entire restaurants dedicated just to that one dish. It also doesn't come with a whole lot of seasonings and it's all about the ingredients. So it's even more important to prepare it to perfection. Even though it's a deceptively simple dish, just a little bit of seasoning and some heat, there's a lot to know before you actually start grilling, searing one or ordering one at the restaurant. So first of all, what exactly is steak? It's a cut from the beef that's cut perpendicular to the muscle fiber. It may or may not include a bone and it's quick cooking, meaning that it doesn't take a lot of time to break down the muscle fiber to get it to a desirable level of tenderness. That being said, steak is also controversial. On the one hand, it's really delicious. On the other hand, it's very resource intensive, it's damaging for the environment and there are lots of health concerns around it. Cattle are often raised under less than ideal conditions. A lot of antibiotics are used and it's often linked to an antibiotic resistance in humans. Even though you can sometimes hear that certain kinds of beef are healthier than others, it's definitely not a health food and the World Health Organization classifies it in the same category as cigarettes when it comes to cancer. There have been quite a few attempts with the paleo diet and grass-fed beef to create a more healthy image of beef, but at the end of the day, it's still not a healthy dish. Ultimately, it's up to each individual to decide whether they wanna eat red meat or not. Personally, I rarely eat it, but I consider it a treat and I truly enjoy it. So what are the two great characteristics of a steak? It's on the one hand, flavor and tenderness. So what makes a steak tender and why is it so important? If you look at search queries, tenderizing steak is a very popular search term and having a steak that is not chewy but pleasant to eat is very important for most people. While there are ways to tenderize otherwise tougher cuts of meat, choosing a more tender cut from the get-go is always preferable. After all, nobody wants a piece of steak that chews like leather. While tougher cuts are less expensive, the best way to start is with a tender cut of steak. So what goes into tenderness? Basically two things. One, it depends on how much the muscle was used and two, it depends on the ratio of collagen with the muscle fiber as well as fat. The less the muscle of steak is used, the more tender it will be. The muscles along the backbone are used a whole lot less than the shoulder or hip muscles of a cattle. That's why I usually don't want a chuck steak. The connective tissue in muscles, also known as collagen, is something that holds the muscle together. During cooking, there is not enough time to break it down and to make it tender. So you want a cut that has the least amount of connective tissue because that will just be more tender. Also, you're looking for finely marbled fat because that will melt quickly during cooking. On the flip side, avoid big pockets of fat because those won't melt. In general, the higher the amount of intramuscular fat, the more prized is the cut of beef. That's one of the reasons why true Japanese Kobe beef is so popular and expensive. It has a lot of fat. That being said, what's sold as Kobe beef in the US is oftentimes a gross breed. And to learn more about that, check out part two of our steak guide. In summary, the most tender cut comes from the backbone of the cattle. It has very little connective tissue and a lot of finely marbled intramuscular fat. As the name implies, the tenderloin is typically the most tender cut. It probably doesn't come as a surprise to you that the most tender cuts come from the smallest, most unused muscles and are therefore the most expensive. So now that you know what makes a steak tender, what makes it flavorful? Of course, the seasoning really helps, but let's just focus on the meat itself. Basically, there are three main factors. One is the amount of fat in the meat, two is the diet of the cattle, and three is the way it was aged. 
Fat is definitely the main flavor component in beef because otherwise it contains mostly water. Flavor carrying molecules are repelled by water but dissolved in fat, which is why the amount of intramuscular fat is so important for a rich beef flavor. Therefore, it's true to say that fat enhances flavor in steak, but at the same time, it also creates juiciness, which is very desired. Grass-fed cows typically have a lower amount of fat because grass is less energy dense than grains are. And at the same time, grass-fed cattle oftentimes walk more than grain-fed cattle. We believe that the most flavor in a steak can be found in a traditional grain-fed piece of beef with a lot of marbling. Grain-fed beef is often not labeled as such and simply marked as beef, whereas grass-fed beef is usually advertised as grass-fed. That being said, it's not something that's regulated by the USDA, so it could be that the cattle has eaten nothing but grass or that it was just finished on hay. It's definitely buyer beware. Last but not least, the aging has a huge impact on the way your steak tastes. Now, in general, people assume that the fresher the beef, the better it is, but that couldn't be further from the truth. All beef is aged because the time is required for the enzymes to break down the muscle into something that is desirable to eat. Even though the beef might look like it was just slaughtered an hour ago, it's not because Typically, beef is aged between four and 10 days at the minimum. So what exactly does aging mean? It's a euphemism for carefully controlled decomposition of the meat. So beef is either dry aged or wet aged. By default, most beef is wet aged and that takes about four to 10 days and it has the advantage that there is no or just insignificant moisture loss. And since beef is sold by the pound or by the kilo, it's desirable for vendors to not lose any weight. On top of that, wet aging ensures that the fresh red color of the beef is maintained. And so people think they're buying fresh meat when in fact it has been aged. Also keep in mind that the four to 10 days are a minimum. Wet aging can be done for a lot longer. On the other hand, dry aging is a very expensive process. The idea behind it is that you reduce the amount of water in the piece of meat, which concentrates the flavor, and at the same time, because it sits there for two or three weeks and sometimes more, you just get more intense beef aroma. In order to dry age beef, you have to keep it at 35 to 38 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about one and a half to three and a half degrees Celsius. At the same time, you need a humidity level of 50 to 60%. And because of that, it's a lot more expensive than wet aging. As a consequence, this is something usually only typically done by high quality butcher shops or restaurants. It's not something you typically find at a grocery store. Typically, only the higher end cuts of meat can be dry aged because it requires a large amount of finely marbled intramuscular fat. During the dry aging process, enzymes are at work that create the flavor and make the meat even more tender. Because dry aging takes so long and it's exposed to the air, you see forms of oxidization, which results in a very dark color. For steak, that's actually desirable. So when you see dark colored steaks that are raw, that's actually good, not bad. So now that you know all the basics, what steak cuts should you invest in? Basically, there are lots of different cuts and we just focus on the most tender ones that we like the most. In our opinion, the best steaks are a ribeye, a tenderloin, a New York strip steak, a sirloin steak, a T-bone steak, and a porterhouse steak. Yes, I also like the flank steak or the flat iron steak, but I'll discuss those in a different video. While all these cuts are worth eating, most people prefer the flavor and tenderness of a ribeye or a New York strip steak or a tenderloin. The ribeye, also known as Delmonico steak, Scotch fillet or entrecote, is a nice cut that comes from the rib area and sometimes it has the bone still in. As the name implies, the cut comes from an area close to the rib and technically it needs to have the bone removed to be called a ribeye. If it has the bone still in, it's called a rib steak. However, in practice, these terms are often used interchangeably. In my opinion, the ribeye is the best cut for people who value flavor over texture, and it's definitely a richly marbled cut, lots of fat, but also nice juiciness. The strip steak, also known as a New York strip or Kansas City strip, is a little less tender, 
but also still very flavorful. It's a short loin or strip loin cut roast and the muscle doesn't get used a lot, so there's very little connective tissue and therefore it's a good cut of steak. In my experience, the flavor of the New York strip is only second to the ribeye. By the way, I also love to use the whole loin to make roast beef. As the name implies, the tenderloin is the most tender cut of the beef. It comes from the back part muscle that is used very rarely, and it's oftentimes also referred to as filet or filet mignon. Now, technically, filet mignon means just the small end of the tenderloin, but in practice, people use it for the entire filet or just the center cut. Sometimes if you're at the restaurant, you see the Chateaubriand advertised, which means it's the center cut of the tenderloin filet. The average beef tenderloin is about three to three and a half pounds with the Chateaubriand, the center cut tenderloin, weighing anywhere between one and a half, two, and sometimes even two and a half pounds. In my opinion, the tenderloin is usually leaner than both the strip steak and the ribeye. It has a nicer texture, but it lacks a bit in flavor. So it's definitely the cut for people who prefer texture over flavor. Because of that, sometimes people like to wrap it in bacon or make sauces to further enhance the flavor of the tenderloin. Typically, it's the most expensive cut you can buy from beef. Now, T-bone steaks and porterhouse steaks are very similar, but are technically not exactly the same. A T-bone is called that way because it has a T-shaped bone with the tenderloin part on the one side and the strip steak on the other. According to the USDA, a T-bone steak just needs a tenderloin part that's a quarter inch, which is quite small. In order for it to be called a porterhouse steak, you have to have at least one and a quarter inches of tenderloin. As a result, porterhouse and T-bone steaks are really large steaks, oftentimes weighing north of two pounds or a kilo. And because of that, I think they're best shared with someone else because it's simply too much meat for one person. The top sirloin cut means it's the most tender part of the sirloin with the bones and the tougher parts removed. It's typically quite lean and also the least expensive cut of all the ones listed here. It's one of the most popular cuts in the US and while it is lean, it's also a little tougher and it doesn't quite have the flavor of the other steaks. At the same time, it's a good budget alternative. Now, if you wanna learn more about the different grading systems for beef, what Kobe beef is, grass fat specifically, or Angus beef, what you should go for, A1, A5, select, choice, prime. Please check out part number two, where I discuss all the things that you should pay attention to when you go out and buy a steak. For even more information about steaks and infographics, please check out the steak out on our website here. In today's video, I'm wearing a typical steak grilling outfit consisting of a blue polo shirt with long seersucker pants and Sperry boat shoes in navy and burgundy.